Hello, everyone. And welcome to Hint Summit, your first panel at Hint Summit. We're so glad to be here. Today, we're going to be talking about unlocking the power of direct primary care through data, so quantifying the DPC primary care experience. We'll start with introductions of myself and the panel, and then we'll move into how we are building evidence of the DPC primary care experience. We're going to end with audience Q&A, so please think up those questions as we go along and save them for the end and, and come up and ask. So I'll start with the introductions. My name is Amy Leidick. I'm head of operations at Hint, and I lead the analytics team. We use all of the data that we collect through our product and transform it into usable insights that our intention is to be able to propel the DPC movement through those insights. Some examples of this you may be familiar with are the DPC Trends Report, the Employer Trends Report. Uh, prior to Hint, I worked 10 years in academia, part of time in UCSF and for a data collection company concentrating on HIV research, and then also I trained researchers on how to use data for decision making, which is part of what we're talking about today. Dr. Yarmy. Hi, I'm Adam Yarmy. I'm a family doctor in Santa Cruz, California, and I've been at a DPC practice since 2016. My name is Emily Scott, and I'm a DPC physician from Irvine, California, Southern California, and I'm thrilled to be here with all of you guys um, just reflecting on these conferences have people filled with such a beautiful moral compass, so I'm really excited to spend some time with all of you guys and talk about how to make a real difference in healthcare. Awesome. I'm Jonathan Bushman, uh, DPC doc in Oklahoma. I've been in business for about six years. Um, we have a MSO as well with three other locations. And uh, yeah, I'm excited about this data. So this is the first time everybody has had a chance to see it. So um, it's exciting. Great. All right. So let's get started. Um, so we are setting out to prove that DPC makes the primary care experience better for all of your patients. This is well known to those of us in DPC, to those of us in this room, but it's less known to the broader public. So we need to build the evidence base so that we can take DPC mainstream, the theme of this conference, and just in general improve healthcare through DPC. Many of you are aware of the quintuple aims for how we improve healthcare. We need to lower costs. We need to improve clinician well-being. We need to improve the patient experience, have better health come outcomes, and achieve health equity. So while we believe DPC does achieve all of those, we've been working with a few other, other groups and organizations to directly quantify some of these aims and how DPC plays a part. So to prove that DPC does indeed lower costs, uh, Milliman Society of Actuaries is working on an analysis of the employer total cost of care. Results are expected sometime in 2025, but they will show the cost of DPC as a benefit for employers versus the cost of traditional primary care for employers. To prove that DPC improves clinician well-being, uh, we have been working with a group called the, the, the Fix Primary Care. They're affiliated with the AAFP, so the American Association of Family Physicians. They acknowledge that DPC is a shining star for physician well-being and have been conducting a survey and interviews with DPC physicians to understand how their well-being has changed from prior to DPC till after. Lastly, to prove that DPC improves the patient experience, Hint Health launched a pilot survey of the person-centered primary care measure. We launched it earlier this year. It's still ongoing, and that's what we're going to be talking about for most of, now, of, most of today. Okay, so what is the person-centered primary care measure, or PCM? PC, uh, PCPCM is the only measure of, from the perspective of the patient that measures the four Cs of primary care. So how does the patient feel about their first contact, comprehensiveness, coordination, continuity? It was designed in 2016 at the request of CMS, so the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, by a researcher named Dr. Etz, whose work really concentrates on improving primary care for the good of all. Um, this measure was developed after surveying patients, primary care physicians, employers, experts across the healthcare industry. It's now a nationally recognized clinical quality measure through CMS. 
What you can see up on the slide on, on the side are the 11 questions that are asked as part of the measure. Um, there's also eight demographic questions. These 11 measure questions are asked on a four-point scale, with four being a response of definitely, one being a response of not at all. So for example, the first question, the practice makes it easy for me to get care. A response of four means the patient agrees that definitely, this practice makes it easy for me to get care. A response of one, not at all, would be, nope, not at all. This practice makes it super hard for me to get care. So the pilot survey that we launched at Hint was a recommendation of Dr. Yarme um, at Santa Cruz DPC, who just so happens to be the DPC doctor of our head of marketing at Hint. So they got to talking and realized that the PCPCM could be a really powerful measure in DPC, being that it concentrates on the patient experience, and DPC is great for the patient experience. So the Hint marketing team took the PCPCM questions plus an NPS, so a net promoter score question. They turned that into a type form digital survey. We recruited clinician sponsors across our Hint client base. And we developed a marketing kit. And so we, they had the language needed to, to be able to send and explain this survey. And so we gave them the marketing kit, that digital survey, and then the, the clinicians sent it out through their existing communication channels. So, for example, for many of you, that's Spruce. When the results came back, we, made, we, we aggregated the results and shared the results specific for that clinic's patients and then for DPC overall. So the clinician could say, hey, here's how my patients feel about this measure, and here's how most DPC patients, to sort of serve that, that comparison. The end goal for Hints is to build the evidence base for DBC. So we aim to create a publication. Once we get all of our, our, our results in, we plan to create a publication that compares the PCPCM among DBC patients versus traditional primary care patients. So what you've been waiting for. So these are the results, the preliminary results of our PCPCM. So like I mentioned, we've launched this. We are, it's still ongoing. So this is the results from our initial, initial launch. So what you're looking at here is the overall performance score. So this is the average of all of those questions across all of the people, all of the respondents. On the one side, the high number of 90%. So that is among DPC patients. So we received responses from 1,217 DPC patients across nine DPCs and the overall performance score was 90%, which is phenomenal. So a grade of A for DPC. The other side is the response, the average response across traditional primary care patients. So the overall performance score was 70. So DPC was about 20% higher. I have a little asterisk about the traditional primary care sample. Um, there's currently no benchmark for PCPCM. Um, we expect one to be published by CMS at the end of the year. For this, we're using uh, Dr. Etz's published study, which is among a general sample of traditional primary care studies, uh, primary care patients. It's not an exact apples to apples comparison. It's the best we have, and it's very close. But once we move on to our publication and down the road, we'd be comparing this to a, a CMS benchmark data. And now for the results by question. So you can see here all of those PCPCM questions. The first column is the results among those 1,217 DPC patients. The next column is the results, the, the average score among those 1,089 traditional primary care patients. And then the last column is the difference of the two. So the DPC score minus the traditional primary care patient score. I've highlighted in green a few of the things that really jumped out at me. So first, that question, the practice makes it easy for me to get care. Among the DPC patients, almost every single one of those 1,217 patients responded with a four, definitely. So that's really powerful. A tenant of DPC is like, we want to make care easy for people, and this is really showing that. Similarly, the third question down, in caring for me, my doctor considers all factors that affect my health. Again, almost every one of those 1,200 DPC patients said definitely, doctor takes all factors that affect my health. So really showing that comprehensiveness of DPC. In that last column, where we're seeing the difference, I also highlighted the areas that you can really see the difference between traditional primary care and DPC. Say either the areas that maybe traditional primary care really struggles or the areas and or the areas that DPC really excels. So the question, my doctor or practice stands up for me. Like the, the concept of DPC as advocacy. 
DPC does 32% better than traditional primary care. And that last question on the bottom, my practice helps me stay he healthy. Primary care, that's, that's the, the point of primary care, is to help people stay healthy. But DPC does that 34% better than traditional primary care. Again, just really showing the things that we believe in in DPC are really coming out with this. On the bottom, you'll see there the net promoter score. So that's a question you've probably been asked throughout your life of, of how likely are you to recommend this to family or friends? In this case, we asked, how likely are you rec to recommend this DPC practice? And across all of DPC, we received a score of 87. <clears throat> that is extremely high. So in healthcare in general, um, a high score is 38 to 58. So we are, it, we're twice as high as the low end of that. If you think of really client-forward companies, say like Apple, a score of 60 to 70 is very good. So 87 is, is blowing it out of the park. So these are our results. Um, I'm going to move now to the panel. So these clinicians, um, they launched the PCPCM at their practice. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what this meant to them and at their practice. So to kind of kick off the conversation, like I mentioned, those of us in DBC, we know the power of it. So why then do we care about collecting this information? Like, What does it mean for your practice and the industry of, as a whole? Um, so I'll start with you, Dr. Dr. Scott. So for your theme, we want to talk more about the patients. Um, so most primary care measures are about process improvement, whereas PCPCM is about the patient. You mentioned how seeing the PCPCM survey results really helped put words to the power of DPC and the culture of your practice. Can you talk a little bit more yeah. about that? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, this topic of how to measure quality is really complex. And when we look at it from the patient perspective, um, we can really see, I think you guys probably already can tell, these questions are much more <laughs> patient-centered. So we're really capturing their experience with these questions as compared to other quote-unquote quality measures that we've seen in the past. Um, in my prior life as a physician at Optum, uh, the corporation really wanted to align their um, quality measures with what they would get reimbursed for, which makes sense as a corporation. It's, it's, you know, it's how it's supposed to work. Um, and, and very thoughtful, well-intended quality measures like let's watch diabetics A1Cs or let's keep track of these complex health conditions for patients because we get paid more if we, you know, if we care for these more complex patients. These kinds of measurements would often lead to these questionable practices. Um, in my experience, practices of creating these coding visits um, where patients would come in just to capture codes, um, which really would take away uh, needed access for patients and wasn't a valuable experience for patients. Um, and measuring people's A1Cs and, and diabetes management is a complex topic. We, you know, we, we have to think about the whole picture when we think about diabetes management. Can the patient afford their medications? Can they, are they terrified of their diagnosis and trying to, to hide from it? Um, there's a lot of layers to this. And so when you just measure A1C without tying it to some sort of patient relation-centered uh, measure like this, you, you might create some antagonism between doctor and patient. Um, it, you know, in my practice, we, I have diabetics who are very well, you know, they're managing their disease very well. They're very active. Um, they are taking their meds. They're following up with me. And then I have diabetics who they're terrified. They don't, they don't want to know they have diabetes. They don't want to put on that CGM because they don't want to know. Um, and so these patients have very different A1Cs, and I work very hard for all of these patients. So I think when we can find a measure that really values the relationship between doctor and patient, we're really finding the cornerstone of how we should be building our systems for primary care. I think this really emphasizes that and really shines a light on the value of DPC from a patient perspective. Great. Thank you. Um, and for you, Dr. Bushman, I wanted to talk more about the business. So you work with a lot of employers and you're a broker yourself. Um, how are you able to use these PCPCM results in your conversations with blo brokers and employers to help bring more patients to your practice? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So um, number one, thank you, Hint, for releasing this data because I have about six employers in the next two weeks to show this to. So this is what I've been waiting for. 
is to be able to show this not just in my practice, but to show the results of the DPC industry, and, and this is a segment of it, to be able to say, in real language, I can put this in front of an HR director and they're gonna immediately know what I'm doing that's magic in DPC, right? Um, if I give them colonoscopy rates and mammogram rates and all, while those things are important, it doesn't really speak to what we're doing in DPC like this kind of a measure does. So this is highly important to me. I really feel like the DPC movement in general, when we think about um, you know, what is it that we're doing in the industry that is so different? And I think this demonstrates it very well because the patient experience in DPC, evidently, is a much better experience. And so many of the, the downstream costs and effects of people's health is really the fear to engage in a health system that gets traditional primary care results, right? I mean, they're just, it's not a good experience and, and what we're doing to reshape that experience is everything. So, um, of course, I love data. I love claims data. I love the way that we can use data to, to kind of tell a story. This is a different story that we haven't been able to express in data before. Um, I actually used the PCPCM for the first time two years ago with a self-funded employer just on my own, and I did it old school route, uh, just paper. Everybody filled it out, and we, we collected our results, put it into Excel spreadsheet, um, and that HR director was blown away by it. Uh, she was like, you're evidently doing something right. And uh, it's like, you know what? Um, these are just our measures and, and this is just a baseline. We didn't actually necessarily create our practice around these measures, but now that we know they exist and we know that this can tell a story, now we can start, we can start using these to actually take those areas of our practice maybe we're not so good at. I was kind of looking through the scores there. 3.3, um, I think, is the lowest, which is this, the care I get in the practice is informed by knowledge of my community. Well, I can imagine as a patient, they're not, maybe not quite sure what that means anyway. But to me, in a community of 60,000 people, what that means is I know every specialist in town, I have their cell numbers, I know where to go, I know what the prices are. Um, we have the right relationships, connections, even with the hospitals and, and CEOs to be able to say, okay, my knowledge of the community as a physician actually translates to better care for my patients. And um, so I would say as an industry, you know, that would be our point is like, how are we as deep, that's, that's what I would say to this group is how are we engaging in our community and showing or using that power to make our, our story even greater. And so I think uh, there's another talk later about community engagement, but that would be a great one to take, uh, to take from this survey. Yeah. yeah. Something that you said that resonated with me as someone who's not a clinician is, say, measures on certain medical conditions and things like that. I imagine when you're speaking to employers, that's sort of like, oh, like they're, they're, you're giving numbers on certain conditions. They don't know what that means. To be able to say, like, this makes the patient feel better. I care well for them. Can you think of an example of how this shifted your language, like your sales pitch, in a sense? Uh, it continues to. Like I said, it's going to continue to change that. But kind of as you mentioned, I'm thinking too, you know, in my in previous time with the health system, there were times where I had patients literally angry with my staff. Maybe me somewhat, but they were angry with my staff because they were there for an acute need, they didn't feel well, and they went through the rigmarole of, um, hey, by the way, you're like six weeks past due for your mammogram. And while that is important, when somebody's coming to you for care like that, and you and you throw that in their face because you've got a box to check, um, a quality metric that is somehow tied back to your payment or your you know, like score, um, is kind of insulting mm -hmm. to the patient. Um, I'll never forget the medical meeting, medical group meeting, where um, they were changing our contracts around and, and embedding quality metrics in our pay. Now, for one, they said, we're gonna, we're gonna take your your yearly pay, we're gonna give you 88% of that, and then we're gonna give you up to a 12% bonus if you meet all the quality metrics. And I'm like, you just told a group of professionals that 88% and add 12% of that equals the first 100%, which is insulting. That doesn't work that way, guys. <laughs> um, and secondly, the quality metrics, now I have to look at my patients differently. It changed the dynamic in the visit of you're actually hurting my score, and, and it shouldn't, we shouldn't have that barrier created by a point like that that changes the relationship. And when, and when I would explain it to patients, they were angry about it. 
that my pay was tied to whether or not I took the recommendation. And if we were creating you know, tension between us because they weren't following recommendation. I remember in that meeting, I literally raised my hand to the medical group president, uh, administrator. And I said, how long before you think the smartest people in this room get rid of the worst patients? And the people who need us the most don't have a place to go because they don't fit the score. That's healthcare. Yep. That's traditional healthcare. Imagine if the score was something about this, like your relationship, your 12% <laughs> was related to like, how well does the patient receive your care? It would, would shift that. Yeah, great, thank you. And Dr. Yarmi, um, I wanted to hear from you a bit more about the industry. Um, we were talking and you had the sentiment that medicine needs a meaningful metric to guide improvements. How do you see collecting this type of information can draw positive attention to DPC, either through, through a, a, as, as an industry to improve your practice and then also just overall? Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, it's really wonderful to have this assertion and this lived experience that we give good quality care seen in the data. Um, I think we can use these data for several things. I put them in three buckets. I think growth, advocacy, and um, more research. In the growth bucket, we've already heard some of this. We can use this <coughs> for uh, brokers and businesses to market how we are standouts. Um, I think physicians uh, can recruit in a way that we haven't. I think it's been remarkably surprising that my colleagues don't really know what I do. I remind them I'm you know, a family doctor doing primary care. <laughs> um, and uh, we now can show our colleagues that um, uh, we are based in metrics that matter to patients and all those other stakeholders that were involved in creating this uh, measurement. That includes uh, em uh, employers, payers, researchers, uh, insurance. There were a whole bunch of people in the room that created this measure. <clears throat> so um, I think on some aspirational level, I think that we can also uh, work on pipeline. I think if we can recruit people to this movement through educators, through our residencies and others to see that. So certainly physicians, we, we've seen these data um, help with our uh, patients. In terms of growth, we also have opportunities that I don't think have been tapped. We have uh, investors, we have grants, we have projects that we have not pursued because we haven't been recognized. Um, I think that's an area where we can tap, and some of that uh, taps into other goals of ours, uh, the quintuple goal of equity. We might be able to reach to deliver this uh, quality care that we provide in direct primary care to new markets. Uh, in the second bucket, uh, uh, which is advocacy, I think of lobbying, policy. Uh, um, later on in this summit, you'll hear people who've been working uh, on these uh, measures such as the, uh, uh, the yeah, primary care enhancement. There's also um, the uh, pre-tax dollars, the uh, HSA. Yeah, these, the, these are things that have been obstacles to us growing. If we can get policymakers who can understand that we provide better care. We also have other areas of policy that we've not really scratched at. There are uh, pilot studies in combining Medicare and DPC. There are Medicaid waivers. There are um, alliances with federal uh, qualified health centers. There are, there are resources that we can tap using these data that I think we haven't yet as an industry. Um, the third bucket is more research. I think this is certainly a pilot study, and I think we'll see more data on the experience of uh, the patient. 
but we still need to show that our uh, quality of care outcomes are there. We need to show that this is a cost-effective model. We can now get um, resources to do this research in a way that I think we haven't. Um, so those are some of the ideas that I think that these data can really help us get to the next phase uh, and um, move this movement in growth, advocacy, and deeper research to support us. I like your point about research as someone coming from a data perspective, a lot of health research, policy research is based on insurance claims and in claims analysis, which is DPC inherently does not have claims analyses. So we have to come up with our own research and our own data to be able to prove this, whereas traditional system can generally find a pretty large sample set through claims data. So yeah, it kind of speaks to the same point. Yeah, thank you. Um, so we'd love to open the floor to hear questions from you all. Anybody have a question for us? Okay, so we'll be coming, Ashley will be coming here with mics. Before we get to that, Amy, I, I wanted to mention too, um, a couple of weeks ago, Jay Keese and a, a group of us uh, met with CMS and talked about this. One of the things that we told them is we have this study result coming out and that piqued their interest because number one, they asked for it eight years ago for it to be created. And so to be able to deliver that to CMS now as you mentioned on the legislative side, uh, that's gonna speak volumes to them if they're looking to create some form of a payment model or, or program through Medicare or Medicaid. So, and hopefully Jay, Jay I think speaks later, he'll, he'll probably touch on that a little deeper. But yeah, this, these are important data for them as well. Great, thank you. Hi, my name's Stan Froswijk. I'm in uh, Ventura, California and opening up my DPC in three months. Congratulations. I'm, uh, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I was curious in the 70 to 90% uh, comparison from the prior slide. Um, we know for a fact that uh, traditional primary care physicians are uh, two major buckets are uh, PMDs in the community that are in private practice versus um, those working in clinics. And I was wondering if the traditional primary care uh, was defined as one, the other, or consolidated. Um, in this case, this is actually just this study specifically is just a general population sample. So this is where these two samples are not apples to apples. Ours is at a clinic, they ask those patients. The 70% is just from the general population. Um, when we move to the CMS benchmark, it is data submitted by the clinic. So it will be, to, to your point, we would know more about the actual clinic. Any other questions? On the left. Um, it will be published soon. I'll I'll have a little call to action at the end. So stay, gotta stay till the end of the presentation. <laughs> so that was uh, one question I had. I'm, I'm Travis Simmons. I'm a family physician in New Braunfels, Texas, and have been doing DPC for two years now. Um, if we wanted to use this data and say like social media, meetings with employers, um, how can we best give you guys credit for the hard work that you've done? Is that something that would be acceptable to y'all? That's, that's question one. And then second, I just wanted to um, mention something. You guys talked a little bit about, you know, as, as we move forward trying to find um, legislators and start making laws at a state national level that can start to I think recognize or at least be complimentary to what we do in DC or to, in DPC. Um, I just spent two days in DC with a group that is um, started up by Pete Sessions, who's a Republican um, uh, from Texas. And so, you know, regardless of where you are in the political spectrum, they are doing something where they're really trying to bring in a lot of physicians um, into DC coming up in quarter one. And I was the only DPC doctor at this meeting and they kept like bumping the conversation to me. Like there were a lot of people with really innovative ideas but they were most interested in DPC. So there's definitely a lot of like fertile ground and receptiveness to what we are doing on a national level. So if you guys have any interest in that, please let me know. But I'd love to know what um, we can do with this data. Yes, um, so we are at, in the sort of the middle of our data collection stage. Um, once we complete the data collection, we Hint will put out a publication. So for those of you who are new to Hint, we have, for example, the DPC Trends Report. We'll publish them, and we make them public to, they were published on our website for people to use as you like. So um, once we close out our data collection, write the report, 
our marketing team will make sure you know that it's out there. <laughs> I think we have time for one more question, if we have one more out there. You see one in the back right there. Hi, my name is Wael. I'm from Pearland, Texas. I'm trying to start a VPC in the next month. Uh, what I found when I talk to people about this is there's, a, that there's an interest, but a skepticism. skepticism. Mm -hmm. they, they don't really have seen this before, and so they are naturally, they're curious. But they say, what if I have really great insurance? So I, I never found the complete great answer to that. You know, how do you compete with insurance when the market is 90% insurance and then the rest, the 10% are uninsured or underinsured? Um, how do you find the way to make DPC stand out other than data points in a conversation with someone who presents to you that they're used to insurance? Have you have a but we're not competing with insurance. We are um, giving the patient a, a connected experience with their physician that they can't get with their insurance. So we're offering them an opportunity to get health care. They still need their insurance. Uh, my experience has been we'll have patients who, uh, uh, most of our patients are, are insured, um, but we'll have some who will come to us uninsured, and then they'll get insurance, and ah, I got my great insurance, I'm going to go to my insurance because I've been waiting for this, and they'll leave, and they'll be back in three months. And, and so, you know, you really, it's not, it's not a competition. It's, we're just offering a different value proposition. I often have a, well, we have a meet and greet policy to see if there's a goodness of fit where we answer a lot of these questions. And a lot of times I turn this back to them. I say, you shouldn't come and join us if you have what you need. If you have a relationship with your physician, if you have access to them, if you have an advocate, if they can come see you and admit you in the hospital, if you can, and I go on and on. And they say, I have insurance. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's a difference between insurance and healthcare. And I think we have to bring that out in our conversations with people. Uh, great. So we're out of time here, but I just wanted to kind of close out. Like I mentioned at the beginning, um, we are working with Fixed Primary Care, who is they're doing research on the improved clinician well-being. This is very preliminary results, but they're working on a, a survey with DPC physicians called the Primary Care Vital Signs, where they're, this is among just 12 respondents so far, but they're showing burnout before DPC after. Burnout has gone down, satisfaction has gone up, visit length has gone up, kind of things that you would expect, but also putting that to numbers, kind of a PCPCM for the physician experience. So to close out, my ask for all of you is help us measure the, the success of DPC. So one QR code here is to launch the PCPCM at your practice. So we have 1,200 plus patients right now. The more of you that opt in to do this at your practice, the better. Our, our goal was to get around uh, higher in the thousands. Ideally, we'd love 5,000 responses. Um, on the other side is the fixed DPC physician experience survey. So we have Dr. Edmund Billings, if you wouldn't mind standing up. This is his first Hint Summit. He is coming with us from FIX, AAFP. He wanted to come and see what this is all about. Um, if you'd like to talk to him about your experience, please find him. He's looking for, for DPC physicians to interview and to, to, to take this survey so he can take this back to AAFP. So thank you all.